<laughs> All right, I haven't focused on trade in this uh, presentation, but okay. we'll, it will certainly come up in passing, no, I'm fine. sure. Anything's fine, thank you. <laughs> All right, um, so yeah, unfortunately the little pictures will obscure the slides a little bit, hopefully not too bad. Um, we don't want to see what's at the end of the New Zealand chart here anyway. It's all looking so good. Now we've got a little bump. Um, but as you can see, it's not the same situation as Melbourne at all. Um, and I think what's happened in Melbourne has really influenced the government's, well, confirmed that the government's plan to go hard and go early if, if COVID did reappear. And very efficiently, it's reappeared twice at the same time, which is just bizarre. Um, but it certainly does underline that we, unfortunately, we can't do this once and do it right and think we've dealt with it, it is going to keep coming back. So I guess um, an optimistic realist would say uh, that our best scenario now is that we get better and better at this, that we do it more efficiently and at least less economic cost every time, uh, but that we keep eliminating it. So in that regard, if we do do what we looks like we're managing to do, which is knock it on the head uh, quickly, then I guess, although it is bad for confidence, the realization that this thing will keep returning at least uh, it looks like we can avoid the fate of Melbourne or the US uh, if, if, we, if the, you know the contact tracing system works and the testing at the border works you know if we will definitely learn by doing every time and in theory we should get better at this so it's not great that it's back but I guess it had a bit of an air of inevitability about it so we are back in lockdown uh, so the top chart shows the April, March, April, May lockdown. That was the week of April 10, which is when we're in level four. And you can see our lockdown was extreme relative to the number of cases we had. We were between Italy and the UK, both of which were facing a full-blown public health crisis. We weren't, but we knew we were going to. So um, we definitely stood out from the rest of the world in terms of going hard and early. And of course, it did work. Uh, and down the bottom, you can see the Google Mobility data for the same sort of thing. It's got um, retail, recreation, workplaces, grocery, farm pharmacy and transit stations. So you can see that compared to the last level three, it's early days. This data is only up to the 14th My or something. But you can see that essentially it's looking pretty similar to last time. And indeed, the um, workplace attendance, if anything, is, is maybe even a little bit lower than it level three last time. So people are doing what they're told on the whole. Uh, the issue, of course, internationally has been people not really, dying, particularly young people were over it. Um, but I think maybe young people in New Zealand realise that if they want to get back to their social lives in their nightclubs, um, then they really ought to just cool their heels for a couple of weeks. Um, because, yeah, they might not die, but if they want to have any kind of social life whatsoever, then really, they really should comply. And I know it's not ideal, this sort of panic, complacency, panic, complacency, but in some ways it is actually, I would argue, better suited to the human psyche. I'm not a psychologist, but we are fight or flight creatures. And what countries overseas are finding is that it's very, very difficult to persuade your population to remain on a state of high alert for a prolonged period about a chronic threat. Very difficult to maintain an equilibrium of low levels of community transmission. Um, and all of a lot of Europe's finding that Ireland and France are case studies at the moment, uh, obviously Melbourne as well. Um, so in that regard, there's something to be said perhaps for battling the lion and then having a snooze and then battling it again. Um, but there, there is really not uh, much of a, an international agreement on what the best strategy is, but given we have better odds than most of keeping it out, and given our health system is not on a par with Sweden's, um, I think 95% of commentators at least are united that um, elimination, rapid elimination is the best strategy for New Zealand. But of course those lockdowns hurt, and they particularly hurt hospitality. Um, they've now learned that they can be shut down with 12 hours notice and throwing out tens of thousands of dollars worth of food. Um, so that's really pretty disheartening. It can't be good for business confidence, for investment and employment. So here you can see the government stringency index, which is basically an attempt to put into a number, an index number, how many restrictions various governments are putting on people's lives. So you can see in New Zealand, we were an outlier on the bottom and now we're back up the top of the pack again. Um, Australia is in the red, higher than us, but we're now, we've now lurched back to being one of the most restricted countries. Uh, the hope being that it'll just be for a couple of weeks and then we can get our 
freedom's back and all go to the rugby again. Um, so that is technically yo-yoing between alert levels, um, but if they're short, sharp shocks, then, uh, you know, see light at the end of the tunnel, then I think it's more manageable economically and uh, mentally than um, the sort of situation Melbourne's got, which is, you know, my boss, even in Sydney, he's been working from home for six months and will be working from home for the next 18, as far as I can tell. So, yeah, whereas we were back in normal, I was travelling around the country, and yeah, of course, now I've got more credits with Air New Zealand from cancelled flights. I'm supposed to be in Wellington this week. Um, but still, it could be, could be worse. Absolutely could be worse, but won't be great. Because uh, under Level 4, about, about two-thirds of economic activity can take place. Under Level 3, about 80%, 80 85 so. Um, so there's quite a big difference, and so certainly level three sounds is a lot feels a lot less manic um, than than last time, maybe because we're all used to this sort of thing. Um, we know what we're doing. We've got this, uh, but basically that was a massive hole in economic activity caused by the last lockdown. We it's really hard to estimate it, but it was probably something like a twenty percent hit to GDP over Q2, um, and then the bounce back was really vigorous. Uh, surprisingly so. So basically everyone saved a lot of money in level four lockdown because all the shops were shut and they also had a little savings account called Italy 2020 which they then drained and bought a spa or an e-bike or something. We knocked a billion dollars off our credit card in level four last time or in the lockdown as a whole and then had a happy time putting it back on. But if you ask people is it a good time to buy a major household item they say no it's not. It's a terrible bloody time. We should all be saving because we might lose our jobs basically. Uh, and yet they have been spending, but it was never going to last. And what we were starting to see was that business confidence and all the activity indicators out of the business survey, consumer confidence, weekly spending, uh, all these things were the bounce was running out of puff. It was all sort of just basically because you need to think about this as a three pronged kind of thing. There's the lockdown, which we now know wasn't a one off, and that's going to cause pure volatility as well as damaging firms balance sheets. There will be, will be some restaurants who just chuck in the towel, uh, for example. Then there's the impact of the closed border. So, of course, it's not as if we could open up the border and tourists would stream in, but nonetheless, so basically, maybe not the closed border, but the loss of tourists and foreign students, uh, that will knock about 5% off GDP. So, um, actual international tourism isn't isn't five percent, but you there's a lot of flow on into retail and hospitality. On the other hand, Kiwis can't go overseas, so that's an offset. And in winter, in particular, that's a really valuable offset. When we'd normally be rushing off to warmer climes to lie on a warm beach, we were all freezing our backsides off in Queenstown instead. Uh, but basically, once that lockdown surge has passed, people will be nervous about discretionary spending because retail, hospitality, tourism these are huge employers. They really punch above their weight in the employment sense compared to GDP. So if, if the recession was because of drought and, and less milk production, the impacts for employment would be much smaller than if it was these really people-centric industries. So here's the Business Outlook survey, a, a range of indices, and I've just standardized them here so you can sort of make them comparable to each other. You can see the lockdown, you can see the bounce, but you can see the bounce was running out of steam at about 2008, 2009 levels. So essentially that's screaming recession. So that's our reward for eliminating COVID repeatedly is a recession. But given what's happening overseas in places like Australia, I'll take that actually. A normal recession would be a good outcome when you're looking at something like COVID. But that doesn't mean it won't hurt. The proportion of people um, taking the job benefit, job seeker benefit has, has risen. The reported unemployment rate is a bit meaningless because basically if you were in lockdown and couldn't look for a job, then you were counted as not wanting to look for a job. So you didn't count as unemployed, which is obviously patently ridiculous. But those are the rules uh, that were designed never envisaging a scenario like that. Um, but by the end of the June quarter, unemployment was just over 6%. And the job seeker numbers have also um, risen to over six. So that's probably a more sensible number to have in your head for where the labour market is sitting at the moment. Um, but it's not done yet because, of course, we've got the wage subsidy scheme, which has just been extended as well. And for a lot of employers, um, keeping going as long as they can, as long as, as, long as they're not hemorrhaging money, so they have relatively low overheads, Staying in business as long as the wage subsidy scheme is going might feel like the morally right thing to do for your workers because 
um, it's much higher than the unemployment benefit is. But it will roll off um, over the next few months. Uh, with the extension, you have to demonstrate a 40% hit to your revenue, um, which is pretty substantial. So it is, will be delaying the impact on unemployment. And it will save some jobs, but not all. And the government was very clear right from the start that it, they couldn't save every job. And they shouldn't even try because this is such a huge shock that the economy needs to adapt and evolve and change shape. You can't put it on ice for three years and pull it out and expect it to be fit for purpose. You obviously need to look after the wounded um, and, and try and do whatever you can to fill the hole in activity and retrain people for whatever new opportunities emerge. But you have to allow that process to run its course in time. Uh, so the fiscal cliff that every, every nation is talking about, which is the end of this massive fiscal stimulus, um, it won't be a, one day to the next, but as the year goes on, the fiscal support will start to run out. Um, so also on the labour market question, we've got um, who's coming home and why? Uh, well, we know it's New Zealanders, obviously. Traditionally, people come to New Zealand for work opportunities, whether they're New Zealanders or others. Uh, this time, of course, they, that's not the reason many of them are coming. They're coming because they've lost their jobs in Australia and the Australian government doesn't allow them to access the social welfare safety net. So what choice do they have but to come back? But if they're coming back here to go on the dole and move in with their parents, then they're not exactly going to be as stimulatory for the economy as if they were coming here to get a job. And we just uh, simply don't know what that mix is, but it does seem likely that the normal migration drivers are not going to hold this time. So you've got a lot more Kiwis arriving, but for different reasons, possibly, that matter. We've got far fewer Kiwis leaving, because the world's a very scary place at the moment, and whether you choose, whether Kiwis choose to leave or not has a huge impact on migration as well, and at the moment the door to Australia is closed. You've got far fewer foreigners arriving, but you've also got nearly half a million foreigners stuck here. That Are they going to leave are they because they can't access social welfare either some of them so we can't get on too much of a moral high horse about the australian government when we're doing the same to some many visa holders will the government extend their visas obviously many businesses are reliant on that labor for things like not just fruit picking but specialized agricultural skills and the like um but the government we don't have the the uh, means to go through every single application individually and decide whether or not they are a good deal to keep them in the country or whether we should force them out. Uh, so there's going to be, have to be some kind of blanket decision and, and uh, there has been none forthcoming, but a lot of those visas, the extension runs out at the end of September. So uh, we have no idea what the government's going to do there. And then also there's the question, the simple logistics, how many flights there are or aren't. So it's affecting everyone, but unequally. Groceries, supermarkets have had a lovely time. Um, online retail favours the big operators. Uh, agriculture is trucked on, forestry shut down during level four, but it's back in business. Food manufacturing, they had to do social distancing for a few weeks, but nothing major, nothing like the disruption seen globally. Construction, well, it can carry on in level three. So um, some of the big sites, the social distancing measures are a real pain in the neck, but for the little sites, house building and stuff, it's just pretty much business as usual. Central government always grows in a recession. But the worst affected, obviously, tourism, accommodation, hospitality, uh, to the foreign education sector um, and <laughs> universities as well. Uh, retail, bricks and mortar, traditional bricks and mortar retail was having a very tough time before all this happened. Um, and once that flurry of spending runs out, there's going to be a lot of empty shop fronts. Commercial property, someone is the landlord for all those hospitality and retail outlets. Um, and the housing market, well, there's a lot of moving parts for the housing market and um, it's, it's rebounded pretty strongly um, at what is traditionally a very quiet time of year. So the seasonally adjusted numbers look spectacular, but um, if you just look at it in terms of the raw, did we make up all the activity that we lost in lockdown? Well, maybe nearly, but it's not some massive overshoot and housing boom, not at all. Um, but I'll talk more about housing because it does have huge feedback loops into the economy. But first, general spending is the chart I was talking about. The best indicator out of our consumer confidence survey is not consumer confidence itself, but the sub-question, is it a good time to buy a major household item? As you can see, that tracks retail sales really well. And you can see it plummeted because all the shops were shut. So it was a terrible time to go shopping. Uh, and then it rebounded, but only a bit over half its losses. And again, like business confidence, 
business activity indicators. It's sitting around 2008, 2009 levels, which is not a time that retailers remember fondly at all. And although, of course, the Reserve Bank is out there cutting interest rates and trying to persuade everyone to rush out and borrow and spend, that is not what any personal financial advisor would recommend to people at the moment. So that is the irony of monetary policy. You're basically trying to trick people into being stupid. So I have a few issues with that. Uh, our forecasts, uh, we actually did change them a bit today, but just we just basically added a bit more volatility uh, around the new lockdown, but also the strongest starting point. But the uncertainty is so massive that I really wouldn't uh, pin your hopes on any particular number. But obviously the nightmare scenario would be a big second wave, and that's what Melbourne is looking at. Um, we're looking at something uh, more like the yellow, I suppose, in volatility, weaker momentum. Every time we get another lockdown, it just takes a bit more wind out of our sails. It's harder to get going again. A uh, huge uncertainty around unemployment because of the wage subsidies and everything else that's going on, and measurement difficulties too. But essentially, if you just look at the G at the employment weights of the worst affected industries, you do end up with an unemployment rising towards 10%, which is a lot higher than it went in the last recession. So eventually, if people don't have a job, despite the mortgage deferral scheme, they will have to sell their house if they have a mortgage. And so that represents a pretty significant downside risk to house prices. But for now, you know, the people are looking at the last recession going up, oh, a little bit of a hiccup, I can, I can hold on through that. Uh, interest rates are at record lows, LVR restrictions have been eased, banks are lowering the interest rates they use to test serviceability, so that means I can borrow more. Uh, let me add it, really. So that seems to be dominating, uh, because there are no forced sales at the moment. The mortgage deferment scheme means that um, people uh, shouldn't be in that position. Some of them might be because they haven't done the research and haven't heard about it, but most uh, people have taken advantage of that. So these mortgage rates are going lower every day, so a term deposit rates, so um, great for borrowers, pretty rubbish for savers. So, you know, the, the people in their 70s and 80s who are reliant on interest income are going to be in trouble. They're going to have to cut their spending. Um, Whereas the people with mortgages, of course, uh, are uh, in a better situation. But will they rush out and spend more or will they just pay their mortgage back quicker? Depends very much on how they're feeling about the future and about their job security and that sort of thing. Uh, so banks have got plenty of cash to lend, at least. And that was not true at the end of last year when the housing market was going strong and people were pulling their deposits out of the bank and going and buying an investment property. So deposits were falling as, as credit demand was rising sharply. Well, this shock has obviously knocked quite a lot of credit demand on the head from businesses at least. Um, and deposits have soared because the wage subsidies all landed in people's bank accounts at the same time. And that was um, indirectly funded by the Reserve Bank buying government debt. Not directly, that would be outrageous. Uh, but a thin veneer of respectability is provided by the fact that they're buying it off intermediaries. So ANZ will rock up and buy the debt at the bond tender and uh, run by the Treasury, and then um, and then the Reserve Bank will buy it off us. We clip the ticket on the way through and say thank you very much. But the fact is, at the end of the day, the government owes money to itself. Um, and today's politicians and today's central bankers have no ability to commit future politicians to treating that debt with the same respect that they would treat debt they owe to anyone else. The assumption is that they will. But for countries where government debt is like 100% of GDP, obviously the temptation is evident and you do have to ask yourself, how different is this really from the 1970s? Which was the last time that people thought politicians could just avoid all constraints on their spending by just this neat trick of printing money. So coming back to the housing market, I uh, stole the right chart off stuff today. Um, so basically you can see the uptake of the mortgage deferral scheme by region and it maps very closely to a chart we put out a couple of months ago about where the most, where the strongest downward pressure on house prices is going to be and it's essentially the tourist trail. And you can see sure at the bottom Rotorua and Queenstown at, at the bottom in terms of the biggest uptake of the mortgage deferment scheme. Half of houses built in Queenstown in the last couple of years have had a little Airbnb unit added as well. Seemed like a no-brainer at the time, but it's sitting there now as extra debt, not generating any income, as you know, the Central Lakes District is now depopulating after years of incredibly strong population growth. So that's an extremely dramatic economic shock for that region. And 
it's um, getting messy. Uh, some anecdotally, some Kiwis and experts are, are taking the opportunity to hoover something up in Queenstown, but many people would be thinking there will be a better time. So people are pretty good at guessing the house price cycle. <clears throat> they don't get the size and the uh, quite right, but essentially their expectation that house prices will rise two percent a year is actually consistent with a small fall in house prices. So. Um, we've been winding back our expectation for house price falls and now that the wage subsidy and the mortgage deferral scheme have been extended, um, probably that'll push the weakness out further as well. But basically you've got huge moving parts and anything could happen from here, frankly. Housing market's practically impossible to forecast at the best of times without record low mortgage rates, migration being anybody's guess. The loss of tourists and foreign students and they need to sleep somewhere and Airbnb has become an increasingly important part of that, which basically is a huge influence on the housing market. Unemployment rate heading north, not rapidly, but steadily. And um, the Reserve Bank easing the LVR restrictions, but really just so the mortgage deferment scheme would work properly, not so that, you know, telling banks to get out there and get amongst it and do incredibly high risk lending just as the economy is tipping into recession. Um, so, you know, different banks probably are interpreting that differently, so I can't generalise, but um, it, it's not an obvious time to take, for banks to take a lot of extra risk at the moment. So New Zealand strengths and weaknesses, I did have COVID free on the top left there, but I had to change it. So uh, good chance of, of repeatedly eliminating the damn thing. Uh, food prices are pretty resilient and that's partly because of supply disruptions and people have to eat even if they're in lockdown. Low fiscal debt start point means we can push the discussion about what we're going to do about all this debt well into the future. And low corporate debt as well. In fact, you could argue we would have been in a better spot if firms had actually borrowed and invested a bit more, but they've actually been pretty cautious over the last 10 years, whether that's sort of post-traumatic stress disorder from the GFC or what, I don't know. Certainly the housing market hasn't been too cautious. Um, but that also means that balance sheets on the whole are pretty strong. But SMEs, little small businesses, they tend to sail very close to the wind. A lot of the hospitality and retail are the ones who are also worst affected. So there is going to be a reckoning there. Weaknesses, complacency. Well, I think we've just dealt with that. Um, our dependence on tourism. Yeah, unfortunately, that's just a mathematical reality that no matter how smart we are, as long as the border is closed, uh, that's going to be quite a big hole in our economy. Um, household debt has crept back up to where it was in 2007. So um, basically, for the person on the street, like the last recession lasted three or four years. So because they, basically lots and lots of people were freaking out about their mortgages at the same time. So you would expect that to be uh, the same case. Same again, that's a pretty good baseline. In Australia, the household debt's even higher. Here it's about 163 or something percent of household disposable income. In Australia, it's very nearly 200%. And their housing market is in all sorts of trouble. And their real wage, their labour market's been much weaker than New Zealand's have had very low real wage growth and a higher unemployment rate, uh, despite a lower participation rate. So across the board, weaker labour market in recent years, and now this. So um, so the, consu the consumer in Australia is not a happy camper at all, and their debt is terrifying. So um, definitely worse than us, but we still have record high household debt. We haven't soared up there, and the quality of bank lending in recent years has been far better than in those silly years of sort of 2005 to 2007. Um, but it's it's still basically whether you're a household or a business or a government, if you've got a lot of debt, you're less agile and you've got fewer options when bad times hit. The New Zealand dollar is holding up pretty well. That's unhelpful, but really what else can we expect? We're a good news story for COVID still. Our commodity prices are holding up and the US dollar is under pressure because, well, they're hardly a beacon of joy at the moment. So uh, we might just have to live with that. Uh, our dependence on China, well, in January when, in February when COVID was ripping through Wuhan, it looked like a vulnerability and then in, by March it started looking like a strength again and then in April, May, the relationship between the US and China started going down the hill, it started looking like a vulnerability again uh, and then they've remained pretty much COVID free while everyone else is turning to custard, so it's looking like a pretty good bet again. So um, yeah, it's a strength and a weakness. But I am optimistic that while there might be a lot of noise, and there's a lot of noise in the Australia-China relationship at the moment, um, our trading relationship should remain quite robust because they need our food and we need their stuff as well. There's a very 
obvious symbiotic trading relationship. They do not want food price inflation, particularly in a time of rising unemployment. And so food imports will be prioritised. So uh, IMF forecasts that developed nations will shrink on average 8% this year. That forecast is getting a little dated, but uh, at the time it certainly raised eyebrows for being so negative. Um, our New Zealand forecast, well, we're not sure, but yeah, something like 5 to 8 wouldn't be surprising. And that's simply because of the importance of tourism in our economy. Uh, and then you get add a few sort of flow on effects into other industries and, and there you go. I can hear a smoke detector going off. We may have to evacuate at some point. <laughs> um, but the lack of social distancing is, is worth a lot uh, in our economy if, if we can maintain it with just little periodic staycations. So here's our commodity prices holding up pretty well there in the orange. Uh, compared to, you know, the light blue there in the middle is other soft commodities. So that's dominated by things like soybeans and cotton and orange juice and whatnot. Um, and then the dark blue is hard, com all commodities, that's dominated by things like oil and steel. So it's not actually a new story that our commodities have been holding up remarkably well. Um, and, but with, with African swine fever, for example, holding up the price of meat in China. So our dairy prices are starting to slip. Uh, a little bit recently, they're down 10 or 11% over the last couple of auctions, but they were up strongly before that. So we have actually revised up our dairy price payout, but it's sort of right on the cusp of where uh, the average farmer is profitable. So any downside from here would be bad news. That said, the average farmer is a mythical being. There is a massive distribution of performance and debt levels across the dairy sector. Uh, so in terms of our exports, uh, the least affected, um, so the stuff you buy in the supermarket, because supermarkets are staying open in all countries. Uh, the stuff we sell to developing nations, because they've got to eat the basic foods, the milk powder, infant formula, burger beef, mutton, cheap lamb cuts, and velvet because of its health benefits. But the worst affected is the fancy food you buy to show off to your friends or your boss at a dinner party, or the food you dine at, or you eat at a fancy restaurant because restaurants are either closed or you just don't want to go there or you're saving your money. So there you're talking about cheese, butter, venison, lamb racks and your prime beef. And wool you can't give away. Um, and the, the uh, loss of suits means that even the fine wool, which has been much more resilient than the coarse, um, is, is really struggling now. So that's a, that's a big problem. Uh, but what we are hearing is that uh, markets are coming and going and waxing and waning and orders are popping up and disappearing and you have to be really quite agile uh, to navigate the um, markets and the logistics at the moment. One thing I think that isn't that well appreciated is that our commodity exports are protecting our import supply chains. The ships are coming here to pick up our milk powder. They drop off a few things while they're here, but that's not the reason they're coming. And we are experiencing pockets of shortages across the retail space and we'll have less choice in a few consumer goods and the precision engineering Industry is doing quite well because you can no longer air freight in a part from wherever in two days reliably. But um, basically, we're actually suffering worse, uh, not as badly as in that area as many other countries, which is, you know, we are at the end of the world <laughs> and it could have been a big problem. And obviously, the government is paying through the nose to keep various air freight channels open as well for the likes of, of medicine and stuff. That, that's just, a, that's expensive, but it's got to be done. So essentially people have got to eat, but they don't have to pay a premium for New Zealand's quality brand and um, their ability to do so is, is pretty, is being hurt at the moment because this is a massive income shock when it comes down to it. And governments are doing everything they can to replace that income with newly printed money. But in the end, it's, it's a real shock and it will have real consequences. You can maybe delay them, but you can't avoid them. Our lives have changed. So coming back to tourism, the flow onto accommodation, air, passenger transport, food and beverage, uh, that's the big sectors that are really hit. Um, and you can see there the composition of tourism. Domestic's actually bigger than international, but the difference is of course that international is fresh new extra money coming in as foreign exchange earnings, almost as much as dairy. Uh, whereas if we rush around New Zealand and spend a lot more money, well, that, that's good, but it's going to come out of something else. And some of it will come out of money we would have spent overseas, that, which is helpful. Um, but it's not earning us foreign exchange. Uh, international tourism is about 8.4% of employment. So, And obviously the trans-Tasman bubble has popped now with what's happened in Melbourne. 
Um, so the seasonality of tourism takes a bit of getting your head around because basically it means that our ability to offset the loss of tourists through the fact that we can't leave the country is highly seasonal. So the last three months are as good as it gets. That's when we normally would have been off somewhere sunny and only a few Australians were here to ski. But come October, there's just going to be a massive, massive hole in tourism cash flows. So the timing was kind of perfect. You can see it. the lockdown started at the end of March. So, um, and the closed border, which was right at the end of the peak season. So firms were sitting on as much cash as they ever do through the year. Um, and so as Kiwis all traveled around New Zealand, we sort of managed to fill the gap of what's normally pretty rubbish earnings anyway, but come October, yeah, the border's still gonna be closed, obviously. And, and um, yeah, a lot of business models simply aren't going to be viable anymore. So they're screaming loudly for more government support. But I mean, how much taxpayer money do we want to throw into keeping businesses open that aren't actually viable for an unknown period of time? And that's kind of brutal, but that's basically the question. Do you send your medics to the worst wounded or do you send your medics to the people with the best chance of survival? No, obviously right answer to that, but at some point you have to prioritize your limited resources. And then migration, yeah, we're going to change these forecasts and assume the border stays closed all next year as well, but who knows. Um, but that seems a more reasonable assumption than the end of this year. Uh, so as I mentioned, we don't know. But um, basically, through the quarantine system, we can <laughs> almost replace the normal numbers of foreigners who would be arriving in terms of just the, the numbers gain. Um, but yeah, there's lots of other moving parts we probably can't make up for the things like the lack of skilled workers coming that we can get through, the visa holders that can't get through, the the, new, the foreigners who are here who are going to leave and can't be replaced. So um, yeah, it's a bit of a mess and it's going to have um, supply implications as well as demand ones. So more Kiwis in, no foreigners in, more foreigners out, fewer Kiwis out. Yeah, if you can forecast migration, good on you. But it's a huge swing variable for our economy. It's massive. It's provided half the economic growth in the last five or six years. Not quality growth, we always have to budge up a bit, but there you go. I'll skip over that because it's taking a little bit of time. Uh, net debt, we see it, well, this is the government's forecast over going over 50% of GDP. We've been there before and we've paid it back um, with a period of, of strong growth, but tough choices when you've got to get the balance sheet down like that. At the moment, of course, the debt servicing costs are very low because the government bond yield isn't even half a percent. Um, but it does raise an interesting question of what would happen down the track if inflation expectations were to rise. And then the Reserve Bank says, because you know, that started pushing up the longer interest rates, the Reserve Bank would say, don't worry, I've got this. I'll print some money and buy the bonds, which buying a bond pushes the interest rate down. But then people go, they're printing more money and inflation expectations go up further. And then the, suddenly the Reserve Bank, the central banks have lost the ability to stop interest rates rising. They either are rising in that scenario because inflation expectations are rising and investors want some recompense for that, or they're raising rates to head off inflation pressures and keep inflation at target. Either way, interest rates are rising and then suddenly government debt that looks perfectly manageable at 0.2% or minus 0.5% or whatever the heck you, the twilight zone we're in now, uh, starts to look very unmanageable very fast. And that is the inevitable end game of all of this, not maybe in New Zealand, because we are not an uncharted territory here in terms of debt yet, um, but in other countries such as the US, where government debt is nearly 100% of GDP. For now, the Reserve Bank's ramped up its bond buying program to 100 billion. That is a third the size of the economy. To put that in context, that is as much as we spent in fighting World War I. So it's a lot of money. But don't worry, it's just pretend. Uh, the government deficits, three years of deficits, about as big as the GFC meets Christchurch earthquake. So that's huge. And what are we getting for it? We're getting firms that aren't falling over. Uh, and hopefully we'll get some infrastructure out of it. But man, there's a lot of money going, <laughs> just going nowhere, really just going into try to, trying to fill the hole and keep us where we thought we were going to be anyway which is quite disheartening. One day we'll have to, um, well, I suppose earthquakes are a bit like that as well. One day we'll have to repair the fiscal position, um, talk about, have a grown up conversation about taxes and the like, superannuation. 
Uh, no one's in a hurry to do that in an election year at least. Uh, so there's the quantitative easing, the bond buying program. See, we were very slow to this particular party, but we're making up for, for lost time. Um, we won't catch the Federal Reserve, though, because they have really crossed the Rubicon. They are not only buying government bonds, they're even buying junk bonds. So um, they're buying anything that moves. The Bank of Japan is buying equities. So uh, essentially, you really start damaging your financial markets at this point. You even start sort of raising questions about whether you are even a capitalist economy at that point. How different is that from the Chinese model giant SOEs by the time you've got the government essentially funding your corporates. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, fiscal and monetary policy coordination sounds like uh, a great thing, but monetary policy independence is, is also a pretty cool thing as well. Um, and of course, New Zealand led the world in that in the um, late 1980s um, with the introduction of an inflation target, which at the time was revolutionary and then it became absolutely standard practice. Um, as I sort of mentioned, down the track, if inflation expectations were to rise for some reason, and to be fair, it's really hard to see what would cause that. Um, but if it did, then um, central banks would have to make a choice, show their true colours. Are they inflation targeters or are they fiscal policy enablers? Um, the two things are the same at the moment, but at some point they won't be. Um, and in the end, you know, central banks were granted their independence by politicians. It's not written in stone. Um, and, and it's going to be challenged, I think, down the track. Not led by New Zealand, not at all. But by countries uh, that are in, in a much worse pickle than New Zealand. Uh, but here, the Reserve Bank's made it clear that if a quantitative easing runs out of, of puff, which it will eventually, because they'll just run out of bonds to buy, uh, then they favour a package of a negative, lower negative OCR and a bank funding for lending program. So that's, they've been very, very clear um, that's what they would do and um, subject to investigating how the practicalities of it. But there was very little conditionality in their statement that this was their preferred approach. So, all right, we'll take them at their word. Um, and because we do see the weakness in the economy getting worse towards the end of the year, that's why we... Um, yeah, we think they will go ahead and cut the OCR into negative territory. So, of course, that doesn't mean you're going to get paid to take a mortgage, and it doesn't mean you're going to get charged to put your savings in the bank. But it does mean more downside pressure on interest rates. And the, the bank funding for lending programs designed to bypass the problem that deposit rates really can't go below zero uh, without a PR disaster. Uh, so, so that though if they just directly fund banks at the official cash rate, then those interest rates can continue to march lower. So it will certainly succeed in getting interest rates lower. Uh, I think you can ask valid questions about what interest rates a half or a bit more percent lower would achieve in terms of stimulating business investment, quality, you know, quality investment that increases future growth, or, or will it just pump up asset prices and house prices and equities? Because some parts of the world have had these exceptionally low interest rates for a very long time now, and asset prices have done rather well. Uh, of course, you never have the counterfactual with macroeconomics, so central banks would argue, well, real growth would have been a lot weaker without these measures. And yes, maybe there's financial stability risks associated with it, but financial stability risks from very deep recessions are pretty awful as well. So uh, we still think this is the best course of action. Um, and so, yeah, who knows? But with, it is clear that, you know, the risks of a deep recession are staring you in the face. They are right there. It's like, do something, do something. Whereas the risks of financial stability down the track from asset price bubbles are, uh, well, this might happen <laughs> five or 10 years from now. So um, we'll worry about that. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. So there is probably a bit of an asymmetry built into how one looks at those two risks. One's a definite smack in front of your face and the other one's a, a possibility down the track. So we're going to have to wait 10, 20 years to, for this uh, policy to be judged in its entirety. Even then, I suspect people will still be arguing about um, whether it was a good idea or not. But the risks are real. The risks of prolonged, very, very low interest rates. The risk is they push up asset prices way beyond any kind of real value in that at some point the party ends in an, in an abrupt way. 
But for now, equities are the US overnight, the S&P 500 passed its previous high and hit a new record high. So a bit difficult to square that with the fact that the globe is in the middle of a nasty pandemic and growth forecasts and therefore earnings forecasts for companies are being slashed everywhere. But if you think about it in terms of where else are you going to put your money now that interest rates are negative or low, very low forever, um, then it makes sense. So, so that's, uh, this is the result of the power of the printing presses. Uh, you'd be very brave to short markets at the moment. You'd probably be very brave to go long either. <laughs> Just, yeah. Luckily, I don't have to forecast equities and I'm not allowed to give investment advice. Uh, so credit spread. So this is basically a price measure of perceived risk. So basically how much extra do you have to pay to borrow if you are a risky borrower as opposed to uh, an investment grade one. And um, obviously if you're a, a risky company, you pay more. You can see the right hand side access, the numbers are much bigger than on the left. But what's interesting is that there was an initial spike when this virus broke out, the pandemic. Um, but central banks have, with their injection been have managed to get it right back down to where it was say at the end of 2018 can anyone remember what happened there i think it might have been a bit of u.s china tension or something trade talks or something i can't even remember what it was uh, same for the you know 2016. so essentially this risk pricing is saying that risks are kind of normal well no they're not <laughs> so not normal at the moment um but what it does reflect is that uh, central banks have been very, very effective in calming markets, which is of course a good thing, but if risk is not being priced correctly, then people will not demand the right amount of it. You know, Econ 101, the price of something should be set to, <laughs> to kind of get that balance right. Um, so essentially the exceptionally low interest rates and the masses of liquidity that central banks are providing are encouraging people to take a lot of risk. And the lesson from the last 10 or 12 years has been We've got your back, basically. Anytime things turn to custard, we will, we will uh, inject massive stimulus and that will, that will help you out. Uh, of course, this does fail the too good to be true test and the point at which it stops working, as I mentioned, is if inflation expectations rise because then central banks will no longer be able to keep interest rates, the longer interest rates down, no matter what choices they make. But at the moment, where's inflation going to come from? That's really not obvious with world, yes, there are pockets of supply disruption uh, in food and the like. In some poor countries where food's a big, big part of the spending basket, they are experiencing inflation. But rich countries where food is much smaller as a market, they're basically, everything's on sale at the moment because demand is so weak. Um, so it is hard to see where the spark would come from for that. Uh, but all this money that's been printed is still sitting there in the basement. Um, and, you know, the 1970s did show us you can have high inflation without strong growth. Back then, it was, of course, driven by an oil price shock. Um, we had the exact opposite oil price shock this year when the price briefly went negative to minus $37. It's recovered still now. It's back in the positives. But it's um, not looking like taking off anytime soon with the huge decline in transport of people and goods that this pandemic has caused. So that's not looking like a likely candidate at all. Um, wars are pretty inflationary, just, just throwing that out there. So key unknowns, can we keep stamping COVID out? How much is this going to cost? Uh, most people accept there is no alternative, that that is absolutely the best strategy for New Zealand, but it's expensive and it's damaging to confidence. How many Kiwis will come home and why are they coming home? Um, this queue of Kiwis is of course stopping people uh, on the whole from importing specialised labour and that will dampen growth as well. Will a vaccine be developed? When will people take it? I saw a headline today that the Australian government will mandate that people have to take it. That sounds, doesn't sound like something a liberal democracy would normally do. Um, so I'm not sure that can be right. But it's certainly true that people who are not anti-vaxxers nonetheless have a reasonable amount of scepticism about a virus that has been rushed through so quickly. Um, and of course, Russia is running a field trial on its entire population. They are rushing a vaccine out without doing the third stage trials. So, and if that goes badly, well, you can forget about anyone in any other country taking the darn thing. So, and quite apart from that, even if people do want to take a, a vaccine, it's going to be logistically unbelievably challenging uh, to roll it out quickly. So, 
there will be shortages. And so you can imagine a situation where New Zealand gets enough of the vaccine to say, vaccinate everyone over 70, uh, everyone with a uh, suppressed immune system, everyone with diabetes or whatever the biggest risk factors are. And then at some point it will become a marginal question of when are we safe enough to open the border? Half the country will be saying, open it, and half the country will be saying, don't you dare. Um, so if you think we're having interesting political debates now, just wait until we get to that point, as we must do at some point. Uh, better treatments are also the, the alternative, that if we can knock this thing on the head early and prevent people getting seriously ill, um, then that would also be an argument. That would also solve this quandary of how long we can remain fortress New Zealand. Uh, will other countries manage to keep a lid on it? Watching Europe, particularly at the moment. What will our trade patterns look like at the end of this? How will all this government debt be paid back? Will it be paid back? Um, and will we see inflation or is it just going to be low inflation forever? Um, what does it mean for global supply chains, for robotics? Robots don't get COVID, um, but can firms even afford to invest at the moment? What does it mean for CBDs, for cities, for retail, the office space, public transport, urban design? It's bizarre that in Auckland, use of public transport has been, still been down 30 or 40 percent since the first lockdown. Even though attendance at workplaces is only down sort of 10 to 15 percent, and or even less before this new lockdown. So, and car usage is up. So, what is going on there? I don't know. Does that mean people maybe there's less traffic, and so people um, prefer their cars, or maybe? Um, there are a reasonable number of people who are actually were still quite scared of catching COVID even through that period where they were told it was eliminated. I don't know, but it's not exactly great for our collective carbon footprint. Politics, well, obviously China and the US not going on, getting on particularly well. Um, you might have to move your little boxes, but basically China as a proportion relative to the US, uh, their economy is nearly 80% as large as the US now. It was 20% just um, 13 years ago. So, yeah, if you're wondering why they're butting heads, it's because the little guy's grown up. Um, yeah, big government, obviously governments are moving left, yet politics is becoming more and more divided. Uh, debt everywhere, you would not believe a chart of US corporate debt, it's unreal. It was at record highs and then this happened and it has gone vertical. Going, <laughs> what? <laughs> right at a time when their earnings are gonna be lower and their ability to pay that debt back is highly questionable. But at the moment, it's all fine because the central bank is in there buying some of it and um, interest rates are so incredibly low that zombies are popping up all over the world. They were just a Japanese problem and, and then a European problem with their negative interest rates. Um, but yeah, a bit of a zombie takeover. Uh, intergenerational fairness. This asset price inflation we've seen in the last 10 years has really benefited the baby boomers at the cost of the new generations coming through and trying to get on the likes of the housing ladder. But if we did see inflation, perhaps the millennials will get the last laugh because for them, their wealth is mostly in future earnings, which are inflation proof, much more inflation proof than uh, anything else. Inequality tinderbox, what we're seeing is that countries with the worst inequality have the least ability to cope with COVID. The extreme is perhaps, you know, South Africa, or places like that with large squatter camps, but even in Australia, where they've gone, they've gone far further down the gig economy line than New Zealand. So the proportion of workers who are part-time has skyrocketed over the last 10 years, whereas in New Zealand, it's actually been pretty steady. A lot of those jobs don't have sick leave. And so Melbourne found that 50% of people were still going to work between getting sick and getting a COVID test. And no, it was even higher than that, 90% of people. 50% of people we're still going to work between getting a COVID test and getting the result. 25% of people who had had a positive COVID test were not at home when they were checked on. Some of that is the result of income inequality and jobs that have pretty rubbish health uh, sick leave attached to them. So um, yeah, and we're, basically we're looking at the, the worst income inequality in say the US since the 1920s, which led to the 1930s which led to the 1940s. So these big macro themes really, really matter. And that inequality is one of the big factors that led into the polarization of politics, particularly, you know, particularly it's obvious in the US, but it's happened everywhere. So the consequences are huge and the intersection of economics and politics is becoming 
very, very real indeed. And I think we're kidding ourselves if we think we can just ignore it and expect social stability to remain. Um, can kicking, oh, and I'd also just say it's not the politicians that have driven this, it's central banks, largely. Though obviously things like labour law matter hugely as well. Uh, can kicking versus reckoning, yeah, are we going to take our medicine or are we determined to always save us from ourselves? The trouble is if you're bailing out the financial system and preventing a financial crisis, that sounds like an excellent idea. But what it amounts to is bailing out the rich again and again. And um, that has consequences both for wealth inequality um, and also for stored up financial stability problems down the track. If people are not allowed to take small losses, then they'll get the impression that risk is actually non-existent. Well, that just cannot be right. The world is a risky place and yet equities are not being allowed to reflect that on balance. And finally, as I mentioned, monetary policy independence and inflation targeting. Inflation targeting has been around since the late 80s. We were the pioneers of it. It may have done its dash because, yeah, it was granted. It was a, a politicians who signed up for it and the politicians can take it away if it's no longer serving their needs as reflected in the preferences of the voting public. In the late 80s, people were sick to death of inflation. Politicians could win votes by solving the inflation problem. That's not today's voting public's main concern. Everyone thinks inflation is dead forever. They're much, much more worried about debt. Well, first about the incomes, and secondly about their debt. Quite different solutions for that. Oh, don't even bother looking at the forecast. They'll be wrong. <laughs> Completely wrong. All right. So I see there is one question popped up. Probably there's a comment saying, Sharon, you're out of time. Stop. Oh, no. Um, Sharon, what is your readout of the impact on the Australian economy with respect to dependence on China? Uh, yeah, I would be pretty worried if I were a, a wine producer. Uh, China is their biggest and fastest growing market. And today, China accused them of dumping wine in the Chinese market. So um, there will be pockets like that where China makes a lot of noise, but they're not likely to, for example, to stop importing stuff they really, really need, like iron ore. Um, so, so that's what I mean about, you know, a lot of much sound and fury signifying, well, if not nothing, then less than you, you might think. But Australia is certainly further down the path of, um, than New Zealand is and facing up to the fact that our two best friends aren't getting along. Um, we, we're still burying our head in the sand, <laughs> and pretending we can stay friends with everyone, even if they hate each other. So uh, that's going to be a more and more difficult position to maintain going forward, I fear. Uh, there are some people who think that uh, perhaps the Trump administration is, is trying to go far enough down the path that um, a new government, should there be one, would be unable to change the direction of things but I'm really not a geopolitical expert, so I, uh, I'll stop there on that topic. <laughs> you guys probably know a lot more about that than I do. Well, um, 